Hello, I'm Miranda. And I'm Lucas. And welcome to another special Halloween edition of that Jorvik Viking Thing podcast. Once again, we will be reading another spooky story filled with trepidation, ghosts and ghouls, and maybe a few other things that go bump in the nights. Each story will be recorded live and read from the spooky tome. This is episode three, and if you missed the first two episodes, use the link in the description below to go back and catch up. If you dig deep enough into the soil of ancient cities like York, you will no doubt come across networks of dark tunnels constructed by those ancient invaders, the Romans. These putrid tunnels are perhaps the greatest accomplishments of their engineers, where our ancient oppressors flushed away all manner of foul waste. But many things ended up down there which the Romans did not expect. Horrifying living creatures that made this wretched abyss their domain. Animals twisted in the stinking darkness into forms most unnatural. This is just one of those tales, an account passed down to us from the distant second century, a story of a creature that ruled over the darkness beneath your feet. This is the story of the thing that came in the night. That came in the night. The city where this horrifying incident occurred was a grand, ancient settlement which stood in the heart of the old empire. And it was a place greatly enriched by the fruits of the sea. A certain house stood on the edge of the city, upon the shoreline, and this was the home to some wealthy merchants, who hailed from the land of Iberia. They were fishermen by trade and had earned the greatest riches exporting fish sauces to hungry provinces across the empire, securing enough wealth to reward themselves with some of the greatest luxuries that Roman life had to offer. They were even able to pay for a remarkable feature to be added to their house, a connection to the city's sewers, meaning that their waste was now flushed away into the ocean, out of sight and out of mind. No more stinking chamber pots, putrid carts of night soil, nor the stench of excrement mingled with the fishy aromas of their profession. Truly, a life of herb and luxury indeed. The fishermen's most valuable commodity was a mixture of fermented fish blood, guts, and heads that they exported across the empire to provinces as far afield as Egyptus and Britannia. And they were ever vigilant for thieves who might steal their precious foodstuffs. Criminals would go to great lengths to steal such valuable cargo, scaling walls, bribing guards, and resorting to bloody violence if necessary. So the fishermen, quite wisely, chose to keep their jars of fermenting fish entrails safely sealed in the most secure room within their house, under lock and key. Though this just happened to be the same room where their latrine was. A safe place, but perhaps not the most hygienic. That does not sound like very clean fish sauce. <laughs> As the evening came to an end and the goddess Nox cast her blanket of darkness over the world, the fishermen retired to their beds, though not before checking that their storeroom was securely locked. Little did they know that whilst they slept, a horror they could not have even imagined made its way into the house with a heart full of greed and ever plotting some evil deeds. The fishermen were not awakened by the shadowy interloper, however, but when the sun rose and the invader had departed, they found the remains of the creature's activity. The storage room was a stinking mess of foul fermenting fluids as every single amphora of the fish had been shattered, leaving reeking residues across the floor. Tiles had smashed where objects had been thrown against them, and to make matters worse, a backflow of sewage appeared to have come out of the latrine. Not a too uncommon occurrence in times of heavy rain. The men were baffled as to what had happened, for the door was securely locked, and the roof and the walls were undamaged, so no one seemed to have forced their way in. And nothing had been stolen except the fish, ruining hours of their labor. They were most concerned that the perplexing thief might return to steal again, so it was therefore decided that a trusted servant would be assigned to the room, armed, ready to ambush any would-be burglar. That sounds foul. <laughs> the servant entered the room late in the evening, bringing only a... Is that I was... a weird Roman word? No, it no. was just bringing only a club, and oh, I, okay. I was going to read bringing the club. Like, it's, it's kind of club. <clears throat> well, yeah, there you go. The servant entered the room late in the evening, bringing only a club with which to defend himself and a single terracotta lamp with just enough olive oil to burn throughout the night and hopefully bring some illumination upon this shadowy mystery. 
The small flame cast imposing, shuddering shadows upon the wall of the room, and the night was completely quiet. All the servant could hear was a quiet, steady dripping noise that came from within the latrine. In the lonely, silent shadows, time became meaningless, and he was unclear whether minutes or hours had passed. But soon, the amphora of sweet, spiced wine that he drank from caught up with him. Mercifully, his master had locked him in a room with a latrine, so he topped up the oil lamp, carried it across the room with him to go about his business. As he finished and reached out for a sponge soaked in vinegar with which to clean himself, he paused, for he was sure he'd heard a noise. He looked around the room, trying to pierce the shadows dancing with sinister delight upon the walls, and then he felt it touch him from beneath. He leapt up in fright and turned around, leaning over the latrine in trepidation and peering into the inky blackness within where he was sure he could make out movement. He reached for his club, ready to strike out at whatever foul thing had dared to touch him. He waited. He heard a scratching noise, and then it crawled out. But it was just a rat. A moderately sized and rather ordinary rat. Such disgusting vermin had been known to occasionally emerge from the sewers, and no doubt the servants would be tasked with hunting down such vermin in the morning following the incident. The servant walked away, brimming with embarrassment for the fear that he had felt. But then he noticed just how terrified the rat was as it scarpered away to hide in some dark corner. Then he was aware that the dripping noise had stopped. Things became eerily silent for a moment, a moment which seemed to last a lifetime, before a new, unsettling sound replaced it. A disconcerting, bubbling sound echoed up from the latrine, growing louder and closer. Then, a strange liquid began to ooze out. It was dark, as black as Ibarakum jet, and it seemed to swallow all the light that shone upon it from the oil lamp. But then things grew worse. A dark shape emerged, a strange form which the man couldn't identify. It twisted and bended in the strange, unnatural motions, and though it was dark, the color of the thing seemed to shift and shimmer as it moved. There was nothing about this creature that was recognizable, no eyes, ears, or mouth, and it continued on and on to emerge, proving itself to be incredibly large and long. The shape then searched about, blindly fumbling through the shadowy room as if searching for something. It appeared to be sightless, for it paid no attention to the oil lamp, nor did it possess anything that could be recognized as eyes. It groped across the tile floor, reaching out ever further and further until finally, it touched a vessel. It slithered around the container before slowly lifting it high and then smashing it against the floor, filling the noxious fishy contents out. And then it wrapped around the largest chunks of the fish, scooping them up and returning back into its dark latrine lair with its stolen meal. This does not sound like a ghost. <laughs> Something a little bit scarier, I think. The man was horrified at what he saw and prayed that the thing would depart, satiated by the fish, but it soon emerged for a second time and once again began reaching out for a second helping. The servant looked down at the club in his hand and resolved that he must do his duty and strike dead at this nocturnal thief, whatever the thing was. He crept slowly towards it, raising the club high, ready to pummel the thing with all of his strength and shatter its bones. But when his weapon impacted the creature, it had no effect. The strength of that blow would have shattered a man's skull. But this thing was spongy and soft, and its twisting, flexible, boneless body seemed to have easily absorbed the blow. But whilst it wasn't hurt, it had definitely felt the impact of the club. And unfortunately for the servant, it began to fight back. The thing changed direction, ignoring the fish supplies and blindly reaching out towards the man. He retreated from it as far as he could go until his back was against the wall and he had nowhere to run. Then it touched him, and the second it had found him, it lunged forward and grabbed his arm, tugging him forwards with ferocious strength. He lurched forward with such force that he dropped his weapon. Not that the club had been effective in any way against the creature. In desperation, he bit down upon the thing, hoping to inflict pain upon it and force it to release him from its grasp. It was horribly soft and rubbery in his teeth, and it left a foul, salty taste in his mouth. But he seemed to have heard it as it released him from its grasp. What is it? It's a monster, Lucas. As he fell to the ground, he landed near the shattered amphora. 
and he reached out for a large and sharp shard of the broken vessel. When the thing writhed around the room searching for its prey, the man crept forward with the shard in hand, hoping that this sharp object might pierce the thing's rubbery flesh and wound it. He struck, and it worked. He sliced through its skin, and strange blue-colored blood poured from its wound. He made ready to strike again, but then, to his horror, a second identical thing emerged from the latrine, snaking towards him and striking out forcefully. He fell backwards and ducked down away from the second sightless thing that was groping hungrily about the room. And thankfully, gods be praised, he still had hold of the sharp shard. He pondered what to do. Should he hide in the shadows or strike out again at the second thing? But within moments, his heart sank as he saw a third thing emerge. Three of these long flailing things now moved about the room, searching for the man and hungry for fish. Were they strange serpents? Were they even three creatures or were they the limbs of some great monster that lay hidden beneath? The servant had no more time or rather no more light left to gaze upon these horrific intrusions for the third thing groped and searched across the floor and as it did so, it brushed the side of the oil lamp, tipping it over and plunging the room into darkness. They found him the next morning, cowering in a corner of the room, battered and bruised, covered in blue and black liquid and reeking of fermented fish entrails. The supplies had clearly been ransacked again and the incompetent servant had utterly failed in his task. When he finally came to his senses, he tried to explain what happened. He told of the many creatures, no, one huge creature with many limbs, no bones, and an insatiable greed. It emerged from the sewers, it was wounded, but he could not slay it alone. Poor guy. I know, I thought he was incompetent as well. The fishermen were perplexed, but some of them were curious to see if they would encounter this monstrous spectacle. So the following night, a large group of them waited in the room, armed with sharp bladed weapons. The thing that came in the night, that midnight marauder, returned once again for its usual feast. But this time, his victims were ready. Armed with razors and choppers, they hacked and sliced at the things, or limbs, or whatever they were, which emerged from below. Slicing some away like gardeners trimming away overgrown vines. One man even swore he saw within the latrine the creature's bulbous face, with a strange alien beak. But this was just a glimpse, for with their collective strength, they had wounded it terribly, and the thing that came in the night retreated, never to return again. Perhaps the creature learned its lesson at the end of the sharp Roman blades, or maybe it swam back out of the sewers into the dark depths of the ocean where it belonged. But then again, when the men would repair these subterranean tunnels, some would note noises, strange shaped shadows dancing in the darkness, and even an inky black substance spreading through the waters. Many such tunnels still exist beneath the old Roman cities, so perhaps in the future we shall take extra care when digging for ancient secrets, as some mysteries are better left forgotten, forgotten, forgotten. Spooky, yeah? Yeah, very spooky. I like they call their toilet a storeroom. <laughs> 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 true, true, true. I mean, we like we keep medicine and stuff in ours, you know? Yeah. Is it so weird to keep fermented fish? <laughs> um, <laughs> not in my house, I suppose. <laughs> so, what do you think it is? Well, it's not a ghost, is no, it? No. Um, it's some sort of toilet goblin. <laughs> it is a toilet goblin. I mean, like, there's always those, you know, like, people think of, like, tabloids saying crocodile emerges from toilet or, you know, like, um, I'm sure in, like, some Florida newspaper right now they're reporting, like, a boa constrictor coming up and biting someone's butt. So, mm. could be that, you know? It sounds snake-like, but it had no eyes or mouth. And it so. really had a beak, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's true, yeah. So it's a bird. It's a, it's, a, it's a bird and a snake. Uh, it's actually that ghost from the first story because, you know, it was shape-shifting. Oh, okay, So yeah. it was just a goat all along. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> what do you think smelt worse, the ghost from episode two or the storeroom from episode three? <laughs> I think probably the storeroom because yeah. it had the toilet and the stinking fish. Yeah. So I just don't really think there's much competition there. Okay. So I think I win. I think that's the scariest story. I think I've got an even scarier one, and best of all, it is a Viking scary story as well. You can't... And Viking trumps Roman. Well, it, that is true, but we'll see if your little scary monster is scarier than mine, yeah? Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Let's find out next time. <laughs> 
that concludes tonight's spooky story, and we hope we didn't scare you too much. We have been your hosts, Miranda and Lucas from That Jorvik Viking Thing podcast. Make sure to tune in next time for episode four, the finale of your Halloween specials. Until then, if you want to learn more about the Romans in York, visit Dig, an archaeological adventure, and become an archaeologist for the day. Likewise, make sure to check out the podcast, all links in the description below. So hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, and don't miss the finale. Leave a comment below, tell us what you think this spooky toilet monster would have been, and tell us if you know any spooky Roman tales. You never know, it could feature in a future project. But until next time, sleep well, sleep well, sleep well. I think that's all we have to say about that.